Well, hi, everybody, and um, welcome to Envy Smart. Um, my name is Brad Clark. I'm an academic at the University of Melbourne, and we're from, I'm from the Australian Laboratory for Emerging Contaminants. We'll start this meeting with acknowledging of country. So we'd like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we meet and pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, Envy Smart occurs each month and really pleased that we can partner with some of these great organizations. So Agilent and Eurofin support us. And um, we've got our partner organizations, which is the Australian Contaminated Land Consultants Association, um, Water Research Australia, and SeaTac Australasia. If you don't have your membership, go and get it sorted. They're great organizations. And we also partner with um, Trajan and EM Separations. The whole program for the year is out, um, but our next two speakers, we're going in for a bit of a, a plastics theme for our next two speakers, which will be pretty exciting. So the fantastic Jen Lavers from the University of Tasmania will be on next month. Um, it says 10 a.m., but it's actually 4 p.m., so sorry about that. And she'll be looking at the effects of uh, plastics on marine, um, marine birds. And Kevin Tom Thomas will be joining us and talking about um, his paper that sort of looked at the health impacts of plastics, but and the talks understanding the plastic sold to minimise exposure. Registrations are open, so and they're the dates that we'll be running those. But today we are here, and thank you, Jenny, so much for agreeing to talk today. I really appreciate this. And uh, Jenny is going to give a talk. To Title, the development of an environmental risk framework for deep sea mine tailings replacement. And Jenny's bios had quite an impressive career. So I'm going to give you a condensed version, everybody. Okay. So Jenny is the chief research scientist at the Center for Environmental Contaminants Research, um, the CSIRO Land and Water in Sydney. Um, she is an aquatic ecotoxicologist with the expertise in the bioavailability and toxicity of contaminants in marine and freshwater systems, environmental risk assessment, downstream impacts of mining, uh, human toxicology, and the derivation of toxicant water and sediment water uh, quality guidelines. Uh, she is a fellow of both the Australian Academy of Science and uh, the Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering. She was the recipient of Australia's Eureka Prize in 2006 and has authored over 375 journal papers, book chapters and reports. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jenny. Well, thank you for that introduction, Brad. And I'll just start sharing my screen. I've just got to do two adjustments for this. So, um, everybody, so get your questions ready. So there'll be time for questions at the end of Jenny's talk. So. Um, you can either ask your questions at the end of the talk through the chat or raise your hand and you can ask directly. So just a minute while I change the other setting on the laptop. Yeah, we just need to flick it around. We're on, um, we can see the... Yes, it's yeah. all right. It uh, takes a couple of, I've got to organise two screens here. So yeah. can you see the full screen now? Yeah, we can. We sure can. Right. And can you see my cursor okay? Yeah. Right, okay, well, thank you, thank you. Look, I'm really sorry that I couldn't be there in person. We originally planned to have this as our first face-to-face -face and virtual event for a while, but uh, COVID got the better of us all. So apologies, but uh, we're back to being on Zoom and of course, getting to be very flexible um, as always. So today I'd like to talk about an environmental risk framework, a generic one that we developed for deep sea mine tailings placement. And although I'm speaking today, of course, it was a team effort and I'll acknowledge at the end, the CSIRO project team that worked on this project, along with the Southern Cross University and Ocean Sciences International. But before I go on to mine tailings placement in the ocean, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the deep sea environment. We know that that's a unique environment. It's very different at depth to the surface. Obviously the much lower temperatures, much higher pressures, and of course the light quality, if it gets that far, is quite different and the low, Light, light, is, light is very low below, you know, about, you know, 200 metres depth below the euphotic zone. The bottom of the ocean varies, but a large part of it is the soft clay like sediments, and it's very low in organic matter. So it really relies on organic matter falling down from the detritus and the organisms in the water column dropping down after they die. 
The pH is already lower at these type of depths, around 4,000 metres. And what's interesting is that there's a, a sort of a tension between the high pressure and the low temperature such that it affects reactions. So the abiotic reactions are much faster at depth, but biological reactions um, are because of the temperature are much slower. So a unique environment like the deep sea obviously contains unique deep sea biota. And the biota are generally um, very diverse, but not very abundant. And they are often large species, slow growing, low metabolic rates and, and long lived. And I'll show you a video of a couple of these uh, organisms in a moment. But because the deep sea biota are used to stable environments, it's believed that they don't cope well with disturbance, whether that's sediment disturbance or uh, deep sea mining or whatever. And of course, there's a lot of uh, luminescent organisms and a lot that don't rely on oxygen, of course, at these depths, but rely on other um, electron donors and acceptors and uh, use other things to be the primary producers. So let's see if this works. I do have a video that was prepared by the Ocean Schmidt, uh, Schmidt Institute. Um, it does go for three minutes, but I just wanted to show you because it has some of the beautiful deep sea pelagic organisms, octopus, um, jellyfish. And, and so it's just really nice to, to have a look at some of the organisms that live at these depths that we don't normally see. So let me press play and hopefully you'll get sound and video. Brad, let me know if you don't. Right, so that are just some of the most amazing sea creatures. I think they're the pelagic deep sea organisms. It doesn't even cover the benthic organisms. So some amazing footage of, of unique um, vertebrates and invertebrates at that depth. So look, um, what I wanted to go on to talk about now is the exploitation of the deep sea. And deep sea mining in particular is um, becoming uh, very common in terms of exploration. There's no production as such, but 
that's when manganese nodules or, or sulfide metal deposits are being um, excavated off the seafloor. Much of it comes to the surface and then most of it then gets redischarged the waste after the processing on ship and the waste goes back into the ocean with turbid plumes. So some of the risks associated with deep sea mining are not dissimilar to what I'll be talking about today. But I'm actually going to only be talking about using the ocean as a, a waste disposal um, option for mine tailings. So that's mines that are on land that put their plumes of tailings and liquor out into the ocean. So what is deep sea tailings placement? It's really just the discharge of these tailings and tailings liquor from on land mines at depth. So they usually have a pipeline that goes down one or 200 metres and then a tailings density current flows down the continental slope with ultimate deposition onto the sea floor, usually at quite some depth, at least 1,000 metres, often a lot deeper at 4,000 metres. So this is the tailings that have been deposited well below the upper surface layers of the euphotic zone. Now, it is different to submarine tailings disposal. That's much more common in Scandinavia, um, where the tailings is disposed of at much shallower depths and with much greater coverage. So there might be one or two metres of tailings at those sort of depths. Whereas with deep sea tailings placement, tailing thicknesses are more usually in the 60 or, or 100 centimetres, not, not in metres. But it's important to remember that the discharges are not just the tailings particles themselves, but it's actually a mixture which contains the metals that are discharged that are not always captured in the processing, waste rock, silt and sand, but as well as that, there's the process chemicals, so the flotation agents and the surfactants and flocculants that they use in the processing prior to discharge. So they really are complex mixtures of, of um, solid material as well as tailings liquor. So why would we put it into the ocean? Well, it is a, quite an attractive option in some ways, particularly in tropical regions such as Southeast Asia and Indonesia, where most of the operations are. And that's because of the geological instability of those areas, the high rainfall, and often land is, is unavailable to build tailings dams. So ocean disposal is, is quite the preferred option and often sometimes less expensive than building a tailings dam and with the risks associated with that on shore. But the trouble is DSTP is really controversial. There's been a lot of um, media coverage of DSTP, uh, particularly recently, and one of the problems is that it is outside the scope of any regulatory um, environment, so at least a, a global regulatory environment. So whereas deep sea mining is covered by the International Seabed Authority in terms of regulations, um, deep sea tailings placement is not covered. It's not covered under the London Protocol because tailings in that are considered to be inert, inorganic geological material, which we know that they're not. So there's not really a global regulation, there's only local um, countrywide and, and local site specific regulation. And of course, with the demand, the increase in demand in particularly for nickel and other metals into electric vehicles and batteries, a lot of the deep sea tailings placement, the mines and the, the tailings disposal are in our Southeast Asian region, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea. And that also happens to be, of course, a hotspot of diversity and particularly the coral triangle. So it's, it's highly controversial around whether we should be putting out of sight, out of mind in this particular area. So what are the, the issues with DSTP? Well, it has the ability to affect not just the benthic organisms on the seafloor, but also the water column organisms, the pelagic species. And because it's so logistically and technologically difficult and expensive to explore the deep sea, we still have a lack of information at a lot of locations about what the biota are. And in particular, we don't have much quantitative data of impacts of current operations. Current operations do do site-specific assessments for impact, but we, there is no really risk framework that is used globally for DSTP. And so that's why we were um, commissioned to actually to develop a generic risk framework for, for these type of operations. It's sort of qualitative, semi-quantitative. We couldn't do a probabilistic assessment because the data just aren't there or they're not publicly available for many of the operations. So here we have um, the, a map just showing some of the DSTP locations currently. So we have some operating mines, um, one in Europe, and most of them, as I said, around the Indonesian PNG area. The green dots are the 
mines that are currently operating and the um, blue and yellow are either approved or potential mines and there's actually quite a few more mines in in processing at the moment that are proposing to do DSTP in this region. And then there's a couple of legacy mines that have closed, Misama in our region and the Garden um, Aluminium plant in France. There's also been a lot of um, mines closed in the Scandinavian region and in North America, but they were all submarine tailings disposal, not deep sea tailings. So now the risk of these operations is going to vary, of course, with location. Uh, and the local oceanographic conditions. They have to be selected so that there's limited um, uh, upwellings in the area, so that there's a start, uh, a, a drop off quite close to the coast. So much of the world's coastline is not suited to DSTP because it doesn't have the right oceanographic conditions. But the risk is also going to depend on the operation. So what uh, metal is mined on land, how large the operation is, how many tonnes are disposed of, the ore type and, and the reactivity of the tailings is also important, and also the treatment prior to discharge. Now, unlike some other operations, it's not really possible to mitigate impacts once the discharge has occurred. Any treatment to reduce the risk has to happen upfront before discharge. So they'll do things like de-aerate um, the, the tailings so that they, they are less buoyant and they settle. They'll dilute them with seawater, they might add flocculants and so on to drop out some of the, the um, chemicals. So it's um, very important that the pre-discharge pre is really the way to mitigate the risks. It's not possible to do that after, after discharge. So in terms of the potential um, effects on DSTP, what's interesting we found is that there is a lot of talk about the potential effects but there's not a lot of evidence yet for actual effects. So we do get evidence from field studies, from mesocosm studies and from laboratory studies, um, but still is either not so much quantitative data or it's not publicly available. But what data there is, um, and certainly potential effects have been discussed and the major effect, as you would expect, is smothering of the sediment floor, the, the deep sea floor, by the tailings material. And as I said before, the tailing thicknesses can be anywhere from just millimetres um, up to several metres if you're talking about shallower um, tailings disposal. And here just on the right, I just wanted to show you just the different types of, of materials. So here on the right, we have natural sediments from a reference condition um, in Indonesia where they're quite sandy and, and very different. On the left, these are the very sludgy, fine particle tailing sediment material. So you can see that that's very different to what's there naturally. So an organism has to be able to cope with this material coming on top of it, um, which can of course have direct toxic effects and also indirect effects from if perhaps they're trying to ingest these particles, if the particles are angular and, and can cause abrasion and also starvation. Obviously this material is very low in organic matter and it's a low organic matter environment anyway. So it can also lead to starvation, particularly for organisms that can't move those sessile benthic biota. So apart from this hyper sedimentation and smothering effects, we can also see potential impacts from the process chemicals. And there's absolutely no data on concentrations of process chemicals um, after discharge that we could find. Then of course, there's the risk of metal toxicity and bioaccumulation, not just on the benthic organisms, but also on the water column organisms. And then we can have a variety of processes like upwellings and resuspension, pipe failures, slope failures, that can actually increase the turbidity and increase the risk. And what we wanna make sure is that that can't get up into the shallower layers and the coastal um, waters and affect um, coastal um, ecosystems. And then of course, we can have remobilization of the contaminants on the seafloor uh, through bioturbation and, and so on. So they're the sort of potential effects. And unfortunately today, I won't have time to go into the exposure assessment we did and the effects assessment. Um, so you'll just have to take my word for it that these are the major effects from, from DSTP. What I can show you though, is, is this conceptual model that we built on some previous conceptual models that have been published just to sort of show you um, the, the main issues. So I mentioned that the tailings comes out, out of the pipe here, usually at one or 200 meters depth, and then it stays um, quite dense and then it flows down the continental slope with ultimate deposition onto the seafloor. And 
it's not just the tailings density current itself, but um, depending on the buoyancy of, of the material, we can have these subsurface plumes shear off at various depths. And those plumes can take turbidity and particles fairly large horizontal dis distances away from the pipe. And what's important is that these plumes do not get up into the surface layers. So the locations of DSTP are, are selected such that this slope is greater than 12 degrees and there's no upwellings or um, systems that would allow these plumes to get up into that euphotic zone. So very careful location decisions are made before DSTP operation uh, starts. Then we've got a range of stresses, as I mentioned. We've got physical chemical stresses, pH and temperature. Noise is another factor that's recently been looked at. Um, we've got stresses like dissolved and particulate metals and the process chemicals. Importantly, turbidity is an important stressor. And then we have a whole lot of um, environmental processes, of course, like flocculation, dispersion, dilution, resuspension, and remobilization that go on that can, can change the environment and potentially cause impacts to, to organisms. One thing also is this, this um, conveyor belt effect. So deep sea is actually connected to the surface through these predator-prey conveyor belt reactions. So you might have some organisms that can vertically migrate through the water column, then these can be the prey for organisms deeper down, and they can be the prey for these organisms. So there actually is connection between the surface and the deep sea through this predator-prey conveyor belt type of reactions. So for our risk assessment, we actually split uh, this the zone into several zones. So we did a risk assessment for eight zones. So we had this mixing zone, so close to the outfall discharge, we had the upper pelagic layer. So that's the water that's above 200 meters. And then we had this deeper water, including the continental slope and the benthos as, a, as another a risk section, if you like, a risk zone. All of this was in the, the mixing zone. Then as we move further away from the pipeline, we have the primary deposition zone. And that is where we expect most of the tailings will deposit. That's where the um, numerical models, um, tailings density models, plume dispersion models predict where the tailings will, will go in terms of the tailings footprint. So that's the primary deposition zone. And we split that into three depths. So we've got the shallow pelagic waters, the deeper pelagic waters, and the benthos. So three different zones within that primary deposition zone. And then we have the secondary deposition zone as we move further away from the pipeline. This is where there is still some tailings that can, can um, be deposited in patches. It's really a transition zone as we move away from impact towards a, a, reference, a reference sites and reference condition. So in this secondary deposit, deposition zone, we might get some tailings and we also have the same three depth zones, the shallow pelagic, the deep pelagic and the benthic. So these are the eight zones, three across and, and several depth zones. And we did the risk assessment in each of these zones because sometimes the stresses and the magnitude of the stresses and the receptors are, are different. So what we did was um, used a stressor-driven risk framework. And this is very simply built up from exposure pathways that we call causal pathways. And we build those into a causal network. So we have a range of sources, there's a range of environmental processes that release that stressor from the source, and that stressor can then have an effect on a particular receptor. And we built up these pathways for every, every source, every stressor, and I'll show you that in a moment. And then we can link all of these causal pathways together in a causal network, and we can score the linkages and determine which parts of the network are going to be at the greatest risk. So this just shows, um, the sources and, and processes and so on that we looked at. So the sources here, we looked at a whole range of things such as pipe leak failures and upwellings and subsurface plumes and tailings currents. Processes, we looked at a whole range of environmental processes that could cause the release of stressor from those sources. We then looked at the stresses, most of which I mentioned. We did include organic carbon, low organic carbon and noise, as well as the, these other physicochemical physico and, and metal stresses. We then um, looked at a whole range of potential effects from toxicity by accumulation, the usual um, things, to smothering, starvation, gill clogging, changes in productivity and predator-prey dynamics. So these were all the effects that we looked at. And then we looked at a range of receptors. So we had receptors that just were in the coastal upper shallow zones. So we have, that's the phytoplankton, zooplankton, 
the mangrove, seagrass, corals, fish, and of course the megafauna. And then we had the benthic components split into three types of receptors. We had the macrofauna that was sessile and couldn't move out of the way of the tailings. We had the mobile macrofauna, and then we included the microbes and the myofauna into one class um, as well. So we had these three different classes of receptors within those benthic zones that I mentioned. So what we did was for every pathway or every source process stressor and so on, we scored the linkages. So for example, if we had a pipe leak, we then look at what was the likelihood and materiality of the pipe leak causing a tailings release. Then we look at whether the process was likely to release a stressor, whether that stressor was likely to have an effect, for example, the decrease in productivity from turbidity, and, and then the receptor that that would affect, for example, phytoplankton. And we scored each of these linkages. And so really what we did was we just scored for likelihood and consequence according to this decision tree. So firstly, was this linkage pathway possible? If it was, was it material? So by material, I mean, was it significant? So was it of significant magnitude, duration and frequency to potentially cause uh, a significant impact? And then we thought about whether it was likely and whether it was certain and, and we scored it accordingly. So that ultimately for every pathway and every linkage, we came up with this sort of risk matrix, which is not dissimilar to what you've perhaps seen elsewhere. So as I said, we only had these four levels of likelihood, not possible, possible, likely or certain. And because of the very limited data out there, we could only have two levels of consequence. Either it was not material, so not particularly significant, not of great magnitude, or it was material. So it was going to be a significant impact. And that then led us to um, develop our, our risk matrix, low risk, um, potential risk, high risk, and very high risk if something was certain to occur and was a material effect. So for example, an, an example of a certain uh, likelihood would be um, smothering by the tailings as they're deposited. That's certainly going to happen in a particular zone and it's going to be a major effect. So it's going to be a very high risk pathway. So based on that, we were then able to set up these, these causal networks. And I've just illustrated this with just one uh, of the eight. And this is in the secondary deposition zone. So this is the zone where a bit of tailings will accumulate, um, perhaps not predicted, um, but it's still not um, as far away as a, a reference zone. And this is the benthic zone. So this is the network for, for the major risks for this zone. And I just wanna show you about the pathway scoring and, and how this works. So if we look at the tailings density current here, there's a number of pathways. It can cause tailings to be remobilized or tailings deposition. So let's just look at perhaps the risk to, from metals to the benthic macrofauna that can't move over here. So the tailings density current, um, there's a high risk that that will lead to tailings deposition. There's a high um, chance or risk that that will um, release dissolved and particulate metals. If those metals are released, there will be toxicity. And if there's toxicity, there will be an impact on these sessile fauna that can't move away. Now, all of those linkages scored the same. So it was a high, high risk pathway. The other pathway where there is tailings or sediment remobilization, that is potentially a risk. It doesn't always happen. So that's potentially a risk. So that linkage here scores as a potential risk rather than a high risk. And if we follow that through, all of the other linkages are the same, they're high risk. So what that means is that whatever pathway or linkage has the lowest score, in this case, potential risk, not high risk, that whole pathway becomes potential risk. So it's only as strong as the weakest link, if you like, in terms of exposure. Whereas the other pathway was potential, I was high risk all the way through. And if we have two pathways, as we do here from tailings density current to here, then we would take the maximum risk pathway. So the risk of the tailings density current via the release of metals and toxicity to those macrofauna is considered to be high risk because there was one pathway of high risk, another pathway of potential risk. So this is how we kind of aggregate and score. Uh, and it's a, something that was been developed fairly recently in another context that we borrowed uh, and applied it to the deep sea tailings. So when we look at those pathways, we actually scored 246 pathways and every linkage within each of those pathways. So it was quite a quite an effort. 
Now, normally, of course, you'd be doing this expert elicitation with a much larger stakeholder group. We just did it with our project team because it was really just to illustrate how it could be done to set up a process, not that the results are going to be applicable in all cases to all site-specific assessments. This was just a generic illustrative way of how it might be done in future. So of the pathways that we scored, you can see here that there was a few pathways that came out to be very high risk, only 11 in all. And it was only the benthic biota in that mixing zone close to the pipe and in the benthic zone where the, most of the tailings is deposited that were high risk, that were very high risk. There was a number of high risk pathways. And again, it was only the benthic organisms that were at high risk, including out further out into this secondary deposition zone. Then we had quite a number of pathways that were potential risk to both the water column organisms and the benthos. And then we had pathways that were low risk and then pathways that weren't possible because there wasn't a possible linkage between a stressor and a receptor, for example. So that's sort of how we, we um, looked at all the different pathways and we set up these networks for each of those eight zones that, that I mentioned. So what's then interesting is, okay, we know there's going to be risks, there has been impacts that have been measured at certain sites, but how quickly are the habitats able to recover after they've been smothered with some centimetres or even a metre of tailings material? So what most of the information about recovery comes from the shallow um, marine tailings placement rather than the deep because there's only one deep tailings placement mine that has closed so far and that was the Missima mine in PNG and so we don't have a lot of information from DSTP but what we do know is that the seawater quality once the mine has stopped operating has closed the seawater quality improves fairly quickly in, in days or weeks however of course as you would expect the benthic ecosystems take quite a long time to recover it can be decades to recover and they don't always recover to the same communities as that were there prior to the DSTP operation ha happening. And their ability to recover depends on quite a number of factors, in particular, how quickly those tailings can be recolonized. And that depends largely on the tailings characteristics that were there from the operation and also the natural sedimentation rates. So if you have an operation that's offshore, that's close to a large tropical river with a lot of organic matter that's going to be deposited into on, on top of those tailings, then you can have perhaps recovery more quickly when you've got these natural sediment on top of the, the tailings material. It also depends on the availability of larval recruits and connectivity and, and currents at depth as well. And obviously on the spatial area affected. What they found from the Northern Hemisphere studies is it seems to be the polychaete worms that are the first to colonise and then the larger slow growing taxa um, come much later. And this was also found for the Missima mine in PNG after it closed. It only operated for a few years though, so it wasn't an extreme case of, of DSTP, if you like. So what I wanted to just finish off now is with just briefly with a uh, part of a, a case study. Um, this was a case study for the Batu Hijau um, copper mine in Indonesia. And I have to say thank you. This is one of the few mines with a DSTP operation that's been going for some 20 years that has publicly available information. And they're quite happy for us to share this kind of information, which is refreshing after some of the operations which the, you know, don't share their, their um, data, their monitoring data. So the Batu Hijau copper mine commenced in 2000, and it is the largest DSTP operation in the world. It processes and discharges something like 140,000 tonnes of ore per day, which is 10 times larger than any other DSTP operation currently going. So it is a huge operation. And what they have is they have two pipelines. So if something happens to one pipeline, they have a second pipeline that discharges 125 metres depth um, um, out in, into the ocean. And then the tailings moves down into the Sununu Canyon, where they deposit at about a thousand meters and then further down to 4,000 meters, about 50 kilometers offshore. So it's a confined um, disposal into this canyon uh, offshore through these two, two pipelines. Now, interestingly, the, before the operation started, they, the oceanographers did, did modeling to predict where the tailings would end up on the sea floor. And they predicted correctly, perhaps the thickness of the tailings, but they didn't predict the footprint of the tailings very well at all. And what they found is that 
the tailings have deposited over a much larger area than what was predicted by the models. So rather than just being over a 200 square kilometre area, they've actually deposited over, you know, nearly in nearly an order of magnitude larger. And there's been bits of tailings or traces of tailings over an even larger area, like into a secondary deposition zone that they didn't predict. So it sort of says that there's need for improvement in some of the models to be able to better predict where those tailings are going to finally deposit. The mine has done a lot of monitoring and I don't have time to talk about everything they've done, but just I'm just highlighting a couple of things. So this slide just shows some of the water chemistry that they've been doing. Now in this mine, they have slightly different zones to the way we did our risk assessment. They have a mixing zone, which is the deep waters in close to the to where the tailings are discharged, including the benthic zone. So they have that deep zone, that's their mixing zone. Then they have the waters, the shallow waters above that, that area, still in the mixing zone. And then they have zone C, which is, is like our secondary deposition zone. It's waters that are outside the predicted zone of impact. And what they've done here, I've just shown some of the copper um, water quality monitoring. This is the zone A, so that's the deep water and um, close to the pipeline discharge. And you can see that the copper concentrations vary and they do go up to about 60 micrograms per litre uh, in that mixing zone. But in that mixing zone, water quality guidelines don't apply. So they only apply to outside the mixing zone, which is the regulation around this mine. Um, CSRO did, so our chemistry group did some, a lot of chemistry monitoring later on, and they found that some of the earlier data such as this was due to contamination and processing and handling and sampling. So in actual fact, most of the copper concentrations uh, in our hands uh, when using ultra trace techniques have shown that copper in this mixing zone is actually usually less than six and a half micrograms per litre. And they, we've also looked at the copper concentrations um, beyond the mixing zone. And this is what's shown here. These are zones B, the shallow waters in the mixing zone and the waters out in, further away. And you can see that the concentrations are mostly below this guideline, um, which is the guideline for outside the mixing zone for copper in water. Uh, the permit limit is, is eight micrograms per litre. So most of these samples have been below that, that limit, except for one or two. So that just shows you some of the, the copper monitoring and how it varies from close to the discharge to further away. They've also monitored a whole range of metals in sediments. And this is how they, they assess where the tailings are moving by measuring metals in sediments. And this is just the copper in the sediments. And again, you'll see this is just two time, time zones, 2007 to 10 and, and more recent, 11 to 2015. And you can see that the copper concentrations in the sediments in that mixing zone close to the pipe discharge in both situations are, are quite high, uh, average of about 900 milligrams per kilogram of copper, which is way above our guidelines. But beyond the mixing zone, the copper concentrations in the sediments are really very low and less than sediment quality guidelines as are the other metals. Interestingly, Indonesia does not have any sediment quality guidelines for metals. So um, we use our Australia, New Zealand um, guidelines, but it's not regulated in terms of metal concentrations in sediments, but they do monitor it very carefully. As well as a whole lot of other type of monitoring, they do do macrobenthos and myobenthos monitoring. I just wanted to show you this one because the red, uh, this is just uh, macrobenthos abundance. The top graph is number of taxa. The bottom graph is um, individuals per square metre. And the red, the red line is the abundance in the mixing zone sediments. And you can see that the sediments are completely depauperate um, in terms of macrofauna. There is very little macrofauna in the sediments in this mixing zone, as you would expect. They have been either uh, removed through smothering or, or they haven't survived. So the um, abundance here is close to zero. As soon as we move away from that sacrificial deposition zone, if you like, then we do see that the abundance of the biota is very similar to um, the green line, which is the control of their reference sites. So certainly um, major impacts um, on the uh, mixing zone fauna in the benthic sediments, um, less of an impact or very similar as, as soon as you move away from that, that zone. 
And that's a very similar story with the myobenthos. So these are the, the, the small copepods, nematodes, microbes that are, you know, less than a millimetre through a sieve. And again, if you look at the red line, uh, the number of taxa and the individual um, taxa per sample, the red line, you can show that, you know, again, they're almost completely absent in the mixing zone, but close to reference um, further away. So this is the expected impact. So really, before DSDP, there has to be some kind of agreement between stakeholders about what you're going to call the sacrificial zone, this primary deposition zone, where you know that the biota are going to be um, basically wiped out um, through smothering and other indirect effects. So it's interesting to look at um, predictions and what actually has been found in the Bardohidio case. So as I mentioned, they predicted that the tailings footprint in both the primary and secondary deposition zone uh, would be relatively small, when in actual fact, the um, predicted zones are much larger and the risk is much larger than what was predicted prior to operations starting. When we then looked at, our, we sort of put it through quickly through our generic risk assessment framework, we actually found that the risks were lower than what we predicted from our generic framework. So from, in many cases, we had predicted that smothering, starvation, metal toxicity in this primary um, deposition zone would be high risk or very high risk. In actual fact, the monitoring um, to some extent has shown um, that the risks in this particular mine DSTP operation were actually lower than what we predicted. And likewise, in the secondary deposition zone, again, some of the risks were lower um, than what we predicted in our generic assessment. So it's not perfect, but it is uh, conservative. It's a, a first pass conservative framework and approach that could be applied to any site specific operation and, and adjusted to, to that particular operation. So just to conclude then, um, I hope I've shown you that the DSTB discharges are complex, that it, they can impact both the water column and the sediment dwelling biota. The major impact is without a doubt smothering and destruction of the habitat. Um, and that has to be agreed on prior to operations because there will be risks and impacts. The very high risk and high risk pathways are really only to the benthic biota. As, as long as the operation is location is chosen to be in the right oceanographic place, then the risks of upwelling and plumes getting into those coastal environments are quite low. As, as has been found so far with monitoring from various operations. We did, as with all risk frameworks, try to do an uncertainty assessment in a very qualitative way, but because of the lack of data, we could really only score confidence as either high or low. And we have included those confidence scores in the paper that we've just published in the Science of the Total Environment that just came out this week. Um, I've, I've, as I mentioned, when the operations cease, the communities can recover but they won't always recover to the same types of communities and they will take potentially decades to recover back to some sort of um, uh, ecosystem that's, that's functioning with ecosystem services. And because um, I think it's important that in future we focus on the secondary deposition zone. We know the primary deposition zone is going to be high risk to the biota, things will be wiped out, but it's really trying to reduce the footprint, footprint of that secondary deposition zone and to monitor it very carefully so we can see if it's spreading and to see how the organisms are coping in that zone. I, I believe that our monitoring efforts really should be focused on that secondary deposition zone and of course the shallow coastal waters to make sure that none of the plumes are um, being upwelled or can get up to the surface and um, cause effects in coastal ecosystems or in shallow waters in, in the euphotic zone. So with that, I'd just like to thank um, the funders of this work was the Metals Environment Research Associations. In particular, I wanted to thank Iperia, Chris Schleckert, and the Ecotox Technical Advisory Panel that I'm on, which um, uh, helped sort of develop the concept. Um, and we wrote a right, work, right paper together about DSTP before we decided to go ahead and try to develop the risk framework. I wanted to thank Jarina from Badu Hijia for providing his data and the project team, just to mention them, Ian Hargraves is from Ocean Sciences International. Ian is an oceanographer with many decades of experience in DSTP operations. Mandy Michael Bruchette, I'm sure you all know, at Southern Cross University, who's our deep sea biota expert. And then our group at Lucas Heights, Lisa Golding, Graham Batley, Simon Apti, Merrin Adams, and Stuart Simpson um, were an important part of the project team. 
And Luke Peters is in CSRO in Adelaide, and he was the one who helped us develop the causal pathways and the risk networks and, and scoring. So thank you very much.